Oh, hello there. Welcome to another character profile. Today, I'm going to be talking about one of the greatest characters in the history of comic books. Popular through most of the world, and whether you know him as Tintin, or Tantan, or Kelfia, you know he's going to go on one exciting adventure after another. Created by the Belgian artist Hergé in 1929, this young reporter has traveled around the world and even to outer space. Though, interesting enough, you don't really see him do all that much reporting. His first appearance came in the comic story Tintin in the Land of the Soviets. While Hergé's art style was primitive at that time, Tintin's penchant for entering in dangerous situations was already established there. Hergé appropriately made Tintin a blank slate, so that the reader could inject themselves into the character. Nonetheless, he proves to be a likable character with the ability at using his gun or his fist, though he finds himself being knocked unconscious on many occasions. Always tagging along is his dog Snowy, who occasionally provides funny asides and is most often smarter than a lot of the human characters. Land of the Soviets also feature political themes that would continue to run through the comics, so Hege would tone them down when the Nazis invaded Belgium. Though none of Tintin's family members are ever shown, he has a wide variety of characters who appear on his adventures. Captain Haddock is a whiskey-loving seaman who he first meets in Crab of the Golden Claws, who is prone to anger and swearing. He is also heir to Mullins Pike Hall, which leads occasionally to him wearing refined clothes. However, he goes back to wearing his iconic blue shirt multiple times in the series, and will most often tag along with Tintin and Snowy. Interesting enough, he probably shares most in common with Snowy, who enjoys a little drink now and again. There are also two bumbling detectives named Thompson and Thompson, who, though they look alike, are not twins or even related, as is commonly thought by most people. You can also tell them apart by their mustaches. While Haddock and Snowy are funny characters, Thompson and Thompson provide most of the funniest bits in the comics with their bumbling antics and their usually incorrect findings, which tend to start with the phrase, to be precise. Professor Calculus is another comedic supporting player, first introduced in Red Rackham's Treasure. And though he is a very good inventor, he has terrible hearing, which causes him to mistake certain words, which causes hilarity to ensue. Finally, there is Bianca Castafore, a diva opera singer with an awful voice, and she particularly aggravates Haddock on multiple occasions. Now that I've talked about the individual characters that make up Tintin's world, let's look at some of the stories themselves. Probably the most well-known Tintin adventure also happens to be my favorite, which is Destination Moon. Featuring that iconic red and white spaceship, it actually is not a science fiction story, as Hergé did a considerable amount of research to make its depiction of space travel accurate. Throw in an espionage plot and some funny moments with Haddock, Calculus, and Thompson Thompson, and it has the right ingredients for a fun story. Hergé's attention to detail was important in his later comics, and he would often look to magazines like National Geographic for inspiration. The follow-up adventure, Explorers on the Moon, also manages to tackle space exploration about a decade before man even set foot on the moon. The Secret of the Unicorn, Red Rackham's Treasure Comics, also brings the right sense of mystery as it goes into Haddock's family background and is definitely an example of Tintin getting himself to a big adventure all through the simple act of buying a model ship. Of course, Tintin has traveled around the world on multiple occasions, like when he went to Tibet, save a good friend of his, and sometimes his job lands him on his escapades, like in the controversial Tintin in the Congo. Hergé also experimented a bit, like with the Custafora Diamond, which only takes place in and around the Marlins Pike Hall. Now, while The Adventures of Tintin was originally written for a children's magazine, Hergé actually tackles some serious subjects. In Cigars of the Pharaoh, Tintin comes across an nefarious cult, and in The Crab of the Golden Claws, he actually finds himself in the middle of a drug ring. He has even fought a fascist regime in Tintin and the Picaros. A large part of Tintin's appeal among adults are these political and social themes that Hege inserted into the stories. When I think of the best, most well-plotted comic books of all time, The Adventures of Tintin are the first to come to mind. It's very understandable why the books proved to be incredibly popular all over the world and translated into multiple languages. In fact, Hege actually helped in supervising the English translation so that the clever wordplay could be preserved. While the books were beloved in Great Britain and certain parts of Canada, Hergé really wanted to attract the American market, but it was always very elusive. European comics in general have never really attracted an American audience, with Tintin and Asterix being the ones I'm most confused as to why they haven't. Hergé even sent some comics to Walt Disney for the possibility of turning them into an animated feature, but they were sent back to him unread. 
Happily, some years later, the Disney Studios gave this picture of Tintin and Mickey Mouse shaking hands. That said, I don't think Tintin and Disney would have been an appropriate fit in my opinion. Nonetheless, multiple screen adaptations have been made of Tintin over the years. In 1947, a stop-motion animated film based on The Crab with Golden Claws was produced, but it only had a very limited run. Two live-action films entitled Tintin and the Golden Fleece and Tintin and the Blue Oranges were produced in the 60s, and Hege notably hated them, not simply because they were original stories not adapted from the comics. Frankly, his characters look rather odd in live-action form, and these films have mainly become obscure curiosities over the years, and nothing else. Belgian animation studio Bellvision also produced a series of animated serials in the late 50s and 60s that were okay in how they tackled the stories, though the animation was very limited. They also produced a couple of animated features, one based on Temple of the Sun, and the other being an original story named Tintin and the Lake of the Sharks, which was rather odd and is probably the adaptation that seems to be most shunned by Tintin fans. However, the screen version of The Adventures of Tintin I grew up watching, along with reading the comics, was the excellent 1990s television series produced by Canadian animation studio Nalvana. After producing a trilogy of Care Bears films, the studio went on to more sophisticated works and turned to European literature for inspiration. Having already adapted Barbara the Elephant with great success, the original intention was to make a Tintin animated feature. A certain Hollywood filmmaker on the film rights at the time, so they decided to make a television series instead. The final result was a fantastic take on the comics, faithfully recreating them on the screen with the same energy and humor and adventure as on the page. The animation, though simplistic, worked very well and the characters were treated respectably. Oh, and need I mention that unforgettable theme song? Seriously, every time I hear it, I get pumped up and ready to go on an adventure. To me, that music will always be the anthem of Tintin. What was also nice about the television series was actually the use of dubbing. The show was simultaneously produced in English and in French, and both versions are great to watch. Even the Dutch and Portuguese dubs are strong efforts, so kudos to young Dirk Beck and Herbert Richards for their superb work there. Well, in any language you watch the Nelvana series in, it did a fantastic job of translating the comics to the screen and will always remain one of my favorite animated series of all time. However, that would not be the final adaptation of The Adventures of Tintin. For years, Steven Spielberg had been trying to adapt the comics to the screen. He first found out about the comics in 1981 when a French critic kept comparing Rages of the Lost Ark to Tintin, and he decided to get a couple of the albums, albeit in the original language. And though he doesn't speak French, he was still impressed by the high quality level of storytelling and the drawing style. Unbeknownst to Spielberg, Hergé was a big fan of Raiders and actually said that he'll be the perfect filmmaker to make a Tintin feature. It's not really surprising though, for years I've told people that have never heard of Tintin that the character was like Indiana Jones but as a reporter. After all, they're both hunting for something, whether it be a story or an artifact, and that ends up leading them on dangerous and amazing adventures. In 1983, Spielberg and his producing partner, Kathleen Kennedy, set out to meet Hergé to discuss a film adaptation, but he unfortunately passed away. A number of years later, Melissa Matheson wrote a screenplay, and some of the sets you see in Indiana Jones' Last Crusade were originally designed for a Tintin feature. However, Spielberg didn't think the time was quite right, and he let the rights slide after a while. About ten years ago, he became interested in tackling a Tintin feature again. Impressed with the work Weta had done on Lord of the Rings, he called Peter Jackson to make a test with a digital snowy. When he got the test back, out came Jackson dressed in full Captain Haddock garb. When Spielberg asked him to help produce the film, Jackson instantly said yes, being a massive Tintin fan himself, and eagerly awaiting what one of his filmmaking idols would do with the character. The decision was made to make the film using the same motion capture technology that was done on Gollum in The Lord of the Rings, and would later be used for the Navi in James Cameron's Avatar. The reasoning behind this was so that they could bring Hergé's art style three-dimensional life while still employing the talents of actors like Jamie Bell, Andy Serkis, and Daniel Craig to portray the characters in both action and voice. Thus, it would be used as a sort of digital makeup. Of course, I'm just quoting this smart fellow in the Wall Street Journal. He seems to know what he's talking about. The decision was made to put Secret of the Unicorn and Crab of the Golden Claws together as it felt that those would be the right stories to introduce the uninitiated to Tintin, especially since the latter is where he first meets Haddock. 
So, in my many years of anticipating it, did Steven Spielberg's take on Tintin live up to my expectations? Well, to be precise, Spielberg did an amazing job of capturing Hergé's globe-trotting reporter in an adventure that never lets go. Right from the opening credits, it brought a massive smile on my face and it stuck there for the entire writing time. However, Spielberg and his trio of screenwriters, consisting of Edgar Wright, Stephen Moffat, and Joe Cornish, are smart to not only appease the Tintin fanbase, but also introducing the character in this world to those who have shockingly never picked up the comic books. The screenplay is smart, with the same wit that made the original adventure so funny. Jamie Bell is the perfect Tintin, making him the likable protagonist so beloved on the page. Andy Serkis brings the right drunken hilarity to have it, and Simon Pegg and Nick Frost, Thompson Thompson, steal the show every time they appear on screen. And of course, Snowy is a great canine companion with similar lenses and incredible stunts. The motion capture never ever reaches Uncanny Valley territory to the point where I actually forgot I was watching to type people in several sequences. I would even go so far as to say this is probably the best effects work ever produced at Weta. Spielberg also delivers some of his best and most breathtaking action sequences with a one-shot chase in Morocco being absolutely stunning and attention-grabbing from beginning to end. The Adventures of Tintin is a rousing, fun-filled, and exhilarating motion picture that truly is like a comic book brought to life. Hege would definitely have been proud of what Spielberg and Peter Jackson have achieved. And with the immense success of this new film, outside of the United States anyway, they've already started discussing what they'll adapt to three more films. Seven Crystal Balls has apparently been thrown about. I think Destination Moon would be a great storyline to adapt, as would Scars of the Pharaoh, though they make a small reference to it in that it's already happened. Maybe even Tintin the Kong... Okay, that one's not happening. Uh, in conclusion, Tintin is one of the great comic book heroes, and it's nice to see him back in the public limelight. See you next time.